In this video, we're finding the electric field of a disk of charge. I'll draw a disk of radius r and surface charge density eta lying in the xy plane. We'll look at the field at a point p above the disk on the z axis. When we looked at a ring of charge in the previous video, the x and y components of electric field canceled out, leaving only the z component. The same is true here. A disk can be made by stacking many rings of increasing radius from 0 to r. Or we can imagine taking a ring and stretching it into a disk. For this reason, we can use the result for a ring of charge that we obtained in the last video. The ring, in this case, has a small thickness, delta r, and carries a small charge, delta q. As we imagine stretching this ring of charge, the amount of charge in a given ring will change as the radius of the ring varies. As the radius changes, the distance from p also changes. Since these terms are not constant, we must integrate, and these terms will be behind our integral sign. We can write the small amount of charge in each ring as the surface charge density times the area of the ring. To get the area of the ring, we can imagine cutting the ring and rolling it out into a rectangle. The length of this rectangle will be the circumference of the ring, 2 pi r, and the width is the small length, dr. We can factor out the constants from the integral and integrate radially from 0 to r. This integral can easily be computed using a u substitution where u equals z squared plus r squared. The derivative of u with respect to r is 2r, and solving for r times dr, which is what we need to substitute for, we find that it's equal to du over 2. We can also change our limits of integration to be in terms of u. When little r is equal to the radius, capital R, u is equal to z squared plus the radius squared. And when little r is equal to 0, u is equal to just z squared. Now our integral is just du over u to the 3 halves, which is the same as u to the minus 3 halves. Our exponent increases from minus 3 halves to minus 1 half, and we divide by negative 1 half. The 2 comes up, and we can move our u to the bottom and make the 1 half exponent positive. Now we evaluate at our limits. Our 2 over 4 reduces to a half, and since we have a minus sign, we can swap our limits to make the signs easier to handle. The square root of z squared becomes z and cancels with our z from before, leaving us 1 for the first term. Then we plug in our limit z squared plus r squared, and we still have a z on top. This is our final expression for the electric field of a disk. And remember, our surface charge density eta is equal to the total charge over the area, which is pi r squared. This equation is valid for positive z values or above the disk. The field is the same below the disk, but points downward, so it's just negative. We can also look at the field far above the disk. As usual, we need to rewrite our expression, and we can rewrite our term in brackets by factoring out a z squared from the radical. It comes out of the radical as just z, since the square root of z squared is just z, and cancels our z from the numerator. Now we can use a binomial approximation, which says that 1 plus x raised to the n is approximately 1 plus n times x when x is very small. In our radical, z is much greater than the radius, capital R, so r squared over z squared is very small. It can be written as 1 plus a small number raised to the minus 1 half power, so minus 1 half is our value of n in this approximation. Plugging into this approximation and then solving, we get r squared over 2z squared. Now putting this back into our equation for the field and substituting q over pi r squared for eta, we see the field reduces to that of a point charge where the distance away is just the distance along the z-axis. This is good because if we zoom out from a disk of charge, it will appear to look smaller and smaller, eventually looking just like a point charge. Another limiting case we can look at is the infinite plane which we get by simply taking our disk and increasing the radius. In the limit where the radius approaches infinity, capital R will be much larger than z. Since the denominator of our second term in brackets is getting very large, that term goes to zero, leaving us with just the surface charge density over 2 epsilon. This is an interesting result because notice that there is no z dependence. That means the field strength doesn't decrease as you move away from the plane of charge, so the field is uniform or constant. This result is technically true for an infinite plane, but it is still a good approximation for the field of a finite plane or plate of charge as long as you want the field at small distances away relative to the size of the plate. We'll see this result again soon when we talk about parallel plate capacitors. For future continuous charge distributions that we'll look at, we'll use a new technique which involves Gauss's law, which will make solving them much easier. So that's it for this video, and I'll see you in the next one.